accept we give thanks to you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for another beautiful day with our loved ones. As we conduct another day, you are forever in our hearts and thoughts. We ask for your love and, and guidance and protection in everything we do. Please watch over us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Please be seated. page in Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where upon entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet set. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, who, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. Throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down to the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Well, let's all sing together. All hail the power. Here we go. All hail. Lift your name on high. Lord, I 
He's going to come read another scripture for us. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equally with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the, like the likeliness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient uh, to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God was highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that, abo that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 5-11. And if you will indulge me. A uh, quick word, I know many, many, many of you have seen Lincoln's name, our grandson's name on the prayer list, and we've been praying and praying, this church has been praying and praying, and I just want to let you know, God hears our prayers, Amen. God answers our prayers, and that Lincoln, uh, for the issue he's been having with his stomach, has been virtually uh, symptom free free for three weeks and it's it is a miracle I give I promised I'm giving all the praise to God this is not an accident this is not a fluke this is nothing like that this is the work of our almighty father in heaven son and holy spirit so Let's go to prayer for our offertory. Dear Lord God, you are so mighty. You are so kind. And, and we just, we're not worthy. Our gifts are not worthy. But you will accept them. I know you will, Lord. And you will use them. You will multiply them because you do impossible math. You take little and you make it much. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that you bestow upon us and we just thank you in the name of Jesus and, and say amen. amen. I will bless the Lord
how great, how great is our God. And all God's people said, Amen. Praise the Lord. was his voice she first heard those kind gentle words asking what was her reason for
you're dismissed. That was a wonderful time of worship. That is a really, really hard thing to follow, I must say. I, uh, of course, I always love hearing them sing together, and so I'm glad to have our, uh, my in-laws here. Um, but yeah, we've just had a, a wonderful time. I love seeing the kids up here doing their thing, and that wonderful testimony, Sandy, thank you for giving us that, and then that song, man, that just, ah, that is, I've just seen Jesus. What a wonderful, wonderful thing that I pray that you have seen him in your life, um, because believe me, he's, he's ever-present all the time, so. I hope you've had a fantastic week. Uh, I'm thrilled, thrilled this morning to be continuing our, our Passion series. And so far in our first week, we talked about how Jesus was, was fueled by love. And in that love, we talked last week that he is, the, he is the humble king who serves a world. I don't know if you've noticed, a world that is in desperate need. Uh, oh, we need Jesus uh, all around us. And today is all about his perfect love, and how he focused on the joy set before him. So that's going to be our main focus this morning. But before we dive in, uh, if you would, pray with me, please. Lord God, we thank you so much, Lord, for the wonderful time of worship that we've had. And Lord, I know the music may end for this part of the service, Lord, but I, I pray that our worship continues as we seek to magnify, glorify, and honor your amazing name, Jesus. I know that uh, being Palm Sunday, Lord, I, I know often we, we talk about your triumphal entry. And Lord, I, I just get, I, I'm in awe that you can come in on a Sunday and that people are ready to kill you by Wednesday as I read your word. And yet so many times in my own life and, and probably others here can attest to so many times, Lord, I've, I've been seeking your face. I see the wonders that you do. And then a few days later, I just forget. And so, God, I pray that we would remain focused in all things and in every facet of our lives for you, Jesus. Everything you do is triumphant, not just a triumphal entry, Lord. We thank you for your perfect love that you saw fit to to die on an old rugged cross for us so that we can have the amazing thing that is eternal life in you, Jesus. We love you. We praise you. That's in your holy name we pray. Amen. (sighs) I'm still trying to recover from that song. It was good. When I was in high school, I I ran cross-country track. Anybody else run cross-country in here? Hey, a few of us. All right. I would pretty much guarantee that you guys were better than me. I was admittedly not a good cross-country runner. If somebody asked uh, what was I, I would say average to very below average runner in cross-country. One day, I remember being at a meet, and I started off so fast. Man, I was pumped. I got tired of being in the middle of the pack or worse. So I said, I'll show them, and I just took off. And I look back, and I'm, I'm way ahead of certain people. I'm so excited about this. I'm, I'm feeling really good about myself. Anybody that's ever done that? you just like, I'm feeling good about me today. And then I suddenly had the urge to throw up that breakfast I shouldn't have eaten right before. Not, not a very wise decision that day. And so then all these people are passing me and trying to avoid me. Like, what is he doing? Well, I ended up that day finishing 105th place. Guess how many were in that race? (laughs) 105. And I was so pumped and my coach was just shaking his head. He knew what a knucklehead I was doing that. Daryl, you always do something dumb. I remember I could just see him saying something like that. And uh, (laughs) it was, thankfully, I didn't count against the team. It only took, I think the last place person didn't count. So praise the Lord for that. Um, But they compiled all the stats with everyone else that got to run in the meet. But hey, I finished. That was my thing. That, I finished. And I was, I was just upset that I didn't finish well. You know, we would, we would train every day. We would run five miles to practice for a three-mile meet. And for whatever reason, I seemed to do a lot better with the five miles than I did for the three. 
And I remember complaining about those five miles, and I just thought that three miles was nothing until you got there. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, I, I didn't do very well. <clears throat> and then I don't know when he started doing this. A few years ago, Katie's brother, whose name's also Scott, um, Katie's brother, got he just really got hardcore into running. and He, he was biking and running. He is, he is just a fit guy. He, he's doing some really neat things. And he showed us all up back in November. He ran, and I do say ran. I think he jogged most of the time a 100K, like an ultimate marathon, whatever you call that, a 100K. That would be like running from here to Mount Pleasant. It's a little over 62 miles. That is just insane to me. And, um, but I say all that to say whether you're running a 5K, a marathon, if you're insane enough like my brother-in-law to run a 100K, <laughs> whatever it is, whatever it is, requires lots of preparation, lots of dedication. And until one crosses that finish line, one cannot lose focus. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 this morning. And as you're turning there, I'll say in running terms, Jesus ran a perfect race while here on earth. And his race, what did it do? It took him to his eventual death on the cross for us. He never lost his focus. And he was fueled on his journey by perfect love for us. Man, I still can't wrap my feeble brain around that. That he saw fit to, like, Lord, do you know all the stupid stuff I've done in my life? He goes, yes. And I still love you with my perfect love. That's just an amazing gift, amen? The perfect love of Jesus. And as it pertains to running, the Apostle Paul, I believe, has some truly profound things to say about self-discipline and training in this chapter. So if you will, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we'll look at verses 19 through 26 this morning. And Paul says, although I am free from all and not any one slave, I have made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. Let me say that again. I hear some flipping still, and that's fine. He says, although I am free from all, and I'm not any one slave, I have made myself a slave to everyone in order to what? To win more people. So to the Jews, he says in verse 20, I became like a Jew to win Jews. To those under the law, like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, to win those under the law. To those who are without the law, like one without the law, though I am not without God's law, but under the law of Christ, to again win those without the law. Verse 22, to the weak, I became weak, in order to what? Win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that I may by every possible means save some. Now I do all this because of the gospel, so that I may share in the blessings Verse 24, don't you know that the runners in a stadium, they all race, but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way to win the prize. Verse 25, now everyone who competes exercises, here he talks about self-control, exercises self-control in everything. And they do it to receive a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. So then he changes the metaphor a, a bit at the end of 26. He says, so I do not run like one who runs aimlessly, or box like one beating the air. So now as he's talking to, these, to, the, to the people here, um, the Greeks enjoyed, uh, they enjoyed two great athletic events. You have the Olympic Games and you have the Isthmian Games. And because the Isthmian Games uh, were held in Corinth, uh, believers there were quite familiar, as Paul's speaking, with this analogy of running to win, as he talks about in verse 24. So he goes on, as we already read, to, to talk about how self-control is crucial to victory. In verse 26, he talks about running purposefully. And his purpose is to what? Did you catch it? Win people to salvation. I circled when in my Bible and in the CSB translation six times. He talks about it here. Six times. When? What's the When? So like an athlete, Paul has this single-minded goal here to bring as many people as possible from whatever station in life to faith in the gospel of Jesus. Amen. And as I said earlier, Jesus ran a perfect race. 
And as we know from, from the Gospels, Jesus was very disciplined with his time. He was very intentional. And he, uh, like what's stated here, he was, he was neither running aimlessly nor boxing the air without effect. No, he fought for you and I, and he has already won that fight. He's already won. And he had an eternal crown in mind, not this perishable crown. Jesus had a specific mission. He had a specific calling. And you and I, we are called to run a similar race. Look at these two verses from Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. Verse 2, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Wow. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. While running through life, it's important that we do so with endurance. Endurance requires commitment to the cause commitment. It invites us to to never give up hope of crossing the finish line. How many of you enjoy watching the Summer Olympics? Just me. Okay, like five of us. Okay. (laughs) So the Summer Olympics, I I used to watch it a lot more as a kid. Uh, But this summer, many of us will watch the Summer Olympics in Paris. And as you do, I want you to remember this sermon. Okay. I want you to remember this sermon as you watch the sprinters. If you see the sprinters in action, if the cameras stay on them long enough, you'll see the sprinters, they'll take off their jackets, right? Their warm-up gear uh, to eliminate the extra weight, the wind resistance, right? So they take off all that stuff they've been practicing in. They'll take all that off. But just like those runners, you and I, we need to drop extra weight. We need to drop the weight. We need to jettison unbelief. And as he talks about hindrances, any hindrance in our life, any interest in our lives that, that might trip us up spiritually and prevent us from running that race well, we need to be rid of it. Because we need, we're, we're trying to get to that finish line. So get all this other stuff off of us. We should all focus on that verse 2 and see that Jesus is the perfecter of our faith as we run the race. God is able to refine us as we run the race with endurance. But, but how? How does that happen? What, and what is required of, of us as we experience this? What's required from me? Well, look at the first thing in your outline, and you'll see it's this. Keep your eyes on the cross. We've already spent time in this series, and honestly, probably every week, we talk about the, how Jesus suffered on the cross for our sins. It was his passion for humanity that held him on that cross. And I believe that if you and I, we personally desire to experience the same passion, to experience Jesus Christ every day in our lives, then we must be willing to fix our gaze upon the cross. Fix your eyes on Jesus. So so think of it this way. Have you ever been running a race and wanted to quit? Anybody? Yeah. Oh, definitely me that day that I was talking about earlier. So you're running a race You want to quit, and then someone comes alongside you as you're about to give up. I'm about to just bow out of this race. Nobody was behind me. I was 105th, so I'm I'm struggling. I'm looking ahead at everybody. But imagine that time you're exhausted, and you want to quit, and that person comes alongside that you're actually ahead of, and they come alongside, and they encourage you, hey, keep going. You got it. You got it. What does it do? It enables you, especially if you know that person, too. It, it kind of adds an extra something if you're just working out together. It enables you to go farther than you could have managed by yourself. It, it does. So it, it shifts your focus from that pain in your legs and your back and, and whatever else, needing some water. And, uh, I'm not, I, don't, I don't even have asthma, but where's my inhaler, right? I, I've had those moments, right? And, but it shifts the focus from that pain instead to the person who is helping you. And you get that second wind. That is such a neat thing to get that, to get that second wind. You start feeling good about yourself. And they feel good about themselves because they helped you along. Well, in the same way, if you keep your attention on Jesus, he will enable you to persevere. 
Oh, focus on him. He says, come on, let's go. Sometimes it's a swift kick in the pants, but let's go, Daryl. You can do this through me. Follow me. Like he said to the disciples, follow me. Yes, Lord, here I, I'm, I'm coming. And you get that second wind. What a great thing. Well, how did Jesus himself reach the finish line? Look at this verse again. How did he do it? For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross. So the Son of God made it through Friday by keeping his eyes on Sunday when he would go back to the Father in heaven and he would sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, too many times preachers, and I, I, I have done this myself, and I'm like, ah, I try to catch myself, but people will say, and three days later, and everybody says, like, no, it wasn't three days. No, it wasn't three full days, 72 hours as you and I would see. Or, or, you know, but, but Friday to Sunday, parts of the three days, right? So on the third day is what we should say, rather than three days later. On the third day, he comes back, amen? amen. Look at verse 3 on the screen for you as well. For consider him, Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. So regardless of the suffering, regardless of the trials that you face, know that resurrection day is coming. Anybody looking forward to that day? It's not just next Sunday, although we call that Resurrection Sunday. Oh, I am looking forward to that day. That is going to be an amazing day. And until then, we consider Christ who endured such mess from people against him so that you and I, don't grow weary and give up. Don't grow, don't grow weary and give up. Follow Jesus. Follow him. He knows the way. As humans, what we do is we experience this ongoing conflict, if you will, between where we, where we fix our gaze versus where we glance. And for many of you here today, maybe, maybe you have felt empty recently. You're not going to raise your hand when I talk about it. Yeah, that's me. But, but you came in. And you just, you felt empty recently. You felt like, I, I don't really have a whole lot to give. And today you're seemingly here, maybe out of some sort of obligation, because, well, I just come every week. Anybody ever been there? You just come, I've been struggling, Lord, going through the motions, just kind of shuffling my feet, ho hum drum, and... You know, I'm a believer in Jesus, been following you since I was 11 years old, and yet I'm constantly dejected looking at my feet. Instead of looking to you, Jesus, or looking up and keeping my focus on you, I come in like, oh, woe is me. And I'm, I'm here because, man, I've come here for 40 years. So, yes, I, I'm here because if I'm not here, you know what, they're going to think, oh, man, what's, what's wrong with me? Maybe you teach a class, and you're trying to teach everyone else. At the same time, you're struggling with this very thing. I've been there, too. I'll tell you, there'll be, there'll be times I will come up here and stand before you on broken pieces. You know, like that Acts 27 chapter. There'll be times where that happens, where I have struggled all week long, but the Lord says, get up there. I called you to this. So, so I get it. Sometimes you feel that obligation, but I'm going to say this. Maybe this is you. Maybe it's because you're just glancing at God while gazing at the world. I'm staring constantly at what the world has going on. And I, God's over here. And I, yeah, I see him. He's, he's in that. I see him. I got him kind of compartmentalized where I want him to be. But he's over here. I, yeah, I know. I know he's there. But I'm really focused on everything and everyone else around me. If that's you, I want to challenge you today to flip that. Make that switch. Let's focus on the Lord. Yeah, the world's over here. I want to focus on the Lord. I want, I want to invite you to spend time gazing at God, beholding him and what he can do and who he is and, and how much he loves you. Gazing at God invites us to spend time with him constantly. You might ask, well, it's easy for you to say you're the pastor. Okay, but how do I do this? Like practically, Daryl, how, how do I actually do what you're talking about? Well, I'm going to give you three ways. There are several but I'm just going to give you three today. Ways to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Here's the first one. Develop a consistent prayer life. There it is. That is key right there. 
If you don't know how to pray, you might, you'll use that as an excuse, right? Well, I don't really know how. The best way for you to learn how to pray is use God's word in doing so. Use his words. Lord, I know that every runner in a race wants to win. God, help me to win for you. Boom. Help me to win the prize that is you, Jesus. I want to live on the other side uh, of eternity. I don't, I don't want any part of this world, God. Lord, help me to exercise self-control as I, as I come into your presence. Help me to dive into your word. Help me to pray more. Help me to pray better. Help me to teach my wife. Help me to teach my husband. Help me to teach my kids to do the very things that I need to be better at, God. Help me to do that. Lord, I don't want some imperishable trophy. I don't care in this, in this day and age where, oh, everybody gets a trophy. Cool. I don't want that. I want what you have to offer, Jesus. Help me, help me to attain that through you. And help me to live for you. God, improve my prayer life. One of the, one of the smallest verses in the Bible, lengthwise. Look at this one. First, First Thessalonians 5, 17 is the main one I want to focus on, but I put those three together. Those have to be together. 16 through 18, you just have to. Rejoice, how often? All the time. And we do that in our prayers. Verse 17, pray constantly. And as you do so, Lord, I rejoice that I have this opportunity. Every day with our kids, we're thankful for Texarkana. We're thankful for our church. We're thankful for you. We name a lot of you by name. We're thankful for Brother Scott and Renee. We talk about them all the time. We're thankful for our Sunday school classes. We pray constantly. And yes, Lord, give, help us to give thanks in everything instead of moaning and groaning. Here's my to-do list of what I need you to do. Lord, help me to pursue that will. Help me to do that. I want to do your will in Christ Jesus. But verse 17 is what I really want to focus on. Pray constantly. It's not just at dinner time or any other meal. But no, I need to pray to Christ in every situation. I need to have that prayer ready. It may only be two words, that verse 17, but oh man, it's such a vital thing. You know that prayer is also the one thing that the disciples really asked Jesus to teach them. Look at Luke 11, verse 1. So he was praying, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, so notice they're observing him do it, so they know it's important. One of his disciples goes to him and says, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. We want, we want to have what you have, Lord, that connection. We Help us to do that. Prayer was obviously important to Jesus. It was important to the disciples. And, and prayer can, can keep our, our focus on Jesus, especially when those winds and waves start to come against us. They crash and they batter. We saw what happened to Peter when he took his eyes off of the Lord. We saw what happened. He focused on the winds and the waves, and, and he started to sink. Oh, Lord, help us to constantly look at you so that we, we don't struggle with that. Fixing our gaze upon Christ means praying when we're in the car. Anybody ever take a long trip and you pray when you're in the car by yourself? Oh man, that is some of the greatest times. I'm only about five minutes away from, from the house to here, so I don't have a lot of that here. But when we go on trips, I love it. And I remember just going to a job 15, 20 minutes away when I used to do banking, and I would just, I would pray to the Lord and, and tears would start coming. Like, What's wrong with me? It's just me by myself. Why am I doing this? And I just knew some person at a stoplight thought, man, what an idiot. What's going on with him? He's crying over here like a little baby. But it was so cool. I, I might hear a song that made me think of something, um, and I could just really focus. It's such a neat thing to have that one-on-one -on -one time. I, I will say while driving, I don't encourage you to close your eyes and pray. I don't know if that's a good idea. Uh, you'll meet Jesus very quickly, I guess, but uh, I don't recommend that. Um, but, but do that while you're in the car. Anybody ever pray, Lord, send me somebody? Anybody ever pray that? And then you go through the drive through instead of get out of your car? Lord, send me somebody, but I'm not going to willingly get out of my car to go see him. Do that. I, I challenge you to do that. Those people that like your coffee every day, whatever, get out of your car. You know Starbucks takes three days to get you that drink. They take forever to get you that drink. And how many people are in that facility in the meantime that you could be telling about Jesus? You can be praying with. You can be seeing what's going on in their life. I encourage you to pray, yes, even while you're frustrating about taking a long time for my coffee. Pray and pray for them. Not just so they don't get your order wrong. <laughs> pray when you drop your kids off at school. Lord, I pray that they do well today. I pray that they are kind to one another. Lord, of course, in this crazy day and age, I pray for their safety. Make the security just a wonderful thing here, Lord. Um, but help my kids to tell somebody about Jesus. 
God, pray for, I pray for them, Lord. Pray while you're in those ridiculously long lines, dropping them off or picking them up. Pray for those people you want to shake your fist at. Let's go, let's go. Right? I've seen those crazy long lines. How about when you're getting groceries? There's 26 lines at Walmart. One is open. Why? Oh, does that frustrate anybody else? I don't want self-checkout. No. I don't want that. They have the best-looking cashiers, though, right? (laughs) Self-checkout. That was lame, I know. But you you have one lane open out of all these lanes, and what do we do? We grumble about it. The one that kills me is Lowe's got this little cookie sheet and I got this. I'm supposed to, how do do I scan it on that thing? I can't. Come help me. You're standing here watching me. (laughs) Drives me bananas. Just do it. You got a little bloop, bloop, scan it. Let's go. But instead of crying about it, like I often do and I need to not do, what if I'm standing in that one line and there's people in front of me, people behind me, and I remain in a good attitude. I could tell them about Jesus. I can tell them about Jesus. I may invite them to my church. I I can do all those things. It's a wonderful possibility if we change our perspective. Lord, I have the opportunity to minister to people that I asked you for instead of grumbling about it. What if God says, no, I want you to learn some patience. I know it's not ideal. It's not great for the economy, in my opinion, either. But this is a good opportunity to talk to people about Jesus. The point is, you should be able to pray everywhere, everywhere. We must train our minds to focus on Christ and stop focusing on all the other stuff, that, that, those things that seek to occupy our time. And there's no limit to the amount of time that we can spend with God in so many numerous oh, different ways. It's such a great thing. And all the time that we, we get to spend with God is meant to direct our focus back to the cross, back to the cross, It is where our hope lies in and and, and, in every season of life while running the race. And as we direct that focus to the cross, what is God then able to do? He's able to refine us and perfect our faith, mold us into who he would like us to be, what he wants us to do. He's able to take us deeper in prayer, deeper into his word. And we we no longer have to do the scratching the surface stuff and, and drink from milk when we ought to be on meat of God's word. The next thing we should do, how about this? Ways to fix your eyes, ways to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Surround yourself with like-minded believers. That is key. I'm not talking about surround yourself with fellow Republicans. I'm not saying surround yourself with fellow Democrats, although we just assume that that's, oh, that's, no. Oh, oh, surround myself with Facebook friends. No, surround yourself with like-minded believers. Believers in Jesus. I had a lady, I had posted something a while back about not forsaking the assembling together, as is the habit of some, Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Well, can you use any other verse that says I should come to church? And I was thinking to myself, I don't know that I need another one, but oh, oh this one's sufficient. Because um, she, she didn't take it. That's not the church. The church is the people. And when he tells us to come and meet together, he just means we're supposed to be out there doing our thing for people. But here's the deal. I don't want to be judgmental, but that person wasn't doing that. You're saying, you're saying it, but you're not doing it. And yet you're wanting to mess with me because of this one little silly post. So here was my response to that person. I, it's no secret that Christians need community, right? It's no secret. We see it all in the Bible. But we see in the book of Acts how the early church was intentional and fellowship. This was my response. This was the verse I gave her. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Hmm. That, and, and I think a lot of that was done in the confines of the church, right? Um, now, of course, they can do those things outside of the church, but in the co- that was also in the confines of the church. They were devoted to coming together as we are today. They were devoted to coming together. We need fellowship, yes, but within that fellowship, we need brothers or sisters in Christ who keep us accountable. Uh Uh-oh. That's like a Christian cuss word, right? Accountability. Oh. When the distractions of this world come, though, we need those 
who will remind us, hey, 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 you're not talking about Jesus stuff. Let's focus on Jesus. You're, you're really negative today. But what if we spin it, not in a 10 ways to be a better you type scenario, but how can I focus on God better? So, no, no, no. I need somebody to slap me on the wrist and say, look, you preach this, but you say that. I need you to hold me accountable. I'm going to do the same for you if you'll allow me to do so. There, there is that, that caveat there. You have to be coachable. You have to let somebody be a part of that, want to pour into you. We need those people that say, hey, 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 help. Let's keep those eyes fixed on Jesus. But not only that, we need them to stand with us in life's difficult seasons. Oh, I need some tag team partners in this sometimes. I know the Holy Spirit's with me. I know the Lord says he will never leave me or forsake me. But sometimes on this side of heaven, I can get so discouraged and I need you. Amen? Amen. You need me. And the prayers, we already heard Sandy talk about, they do what? They work because our God is on the move. Can we move alongside together with him and for him? Oh, yes, please. Let's look at part C, the third thing. How do we keep those eyes fixed on Jesus? Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you every day, daily, daily. From that moment of salvation, a Christian is sealed by the Holy Spirit. Look at these two verses from Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him, you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you what? Heard the word of truth. We should all be hearing the word of truth from God's word. The gospel of your salvation and when you believe, look at the next verse. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance. It's like the engagement ring and the best is yet to come, right? Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. And many seem that they look at this and are like, yep, as soon as I'm a believer in Jesus, boom, there's the Holy Spirit indwelling in me. And yes, that's true. But many seem to think this is a one and done thing. I don't need to ask the Holy Spirit to fill me up again. I don't need that. But look at what Paul says later in Ephesians. Ephesians 5.18, he says a little differently. He says, don't get drunk with wine, which, re which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit. Don't be filled by spirits, the drinks. Be filled by the Holy Spirit. Having a constant filling of that Holy Spirit uh, of him will keep our eyes fixed on Jesus because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. Amen? Allowing God to perfect our faith, it does not just include gazing at the cross. The second thing you've seen in your outline is we must also endure whatever the race brings. Whatever the race brings. The Bible makes it abundantly clear you will face hard times. There will be hard times we face while running this race. So you and I, we have to learn how to endure frustration. Anybody been frustrated? Yes. Just this week, Lord. Maybe this morning. I was this morning with my kids. But I need to be able to endure frustration, endure pain, endure hardship. Look at John 16, 33. What does Jesus say here? I've told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. You will have, no might, no maybe, you will have suffering in this world. Oh, but be courageous. I have conquered the world. Oh, Jesus has conquered the world. Look at James 1, verse 2. This is a hard verse to live out, but consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials. What? Considered a great joy. Yes, trials, trials are unavoidable. But that doesn't mean they have to be unprofitable. And they, how many of you have grown from trials in your life? And I, I, do I look forward to those things? No. But later on, oh, good old hindsight says that was a great time of learning for the Lord. Regardless of how the world beats you down, you have Reason to live with faith, bold faith, because Jesus is the sovereign king over the world. He has defeated sin, he has defeated Satan, and he has defeated death. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, your eternity is secure. You will not lose that. Wow, what an amazing thing, what an amazing that is. 
You know, if we could lose our salvation, we would. Why? Because we're sinners. Saved by grace. That's the only way, through Jesus. Jesus has the power to overrule your earthly circumstances. I know you know that. And knowing this truth and maintaining this intimate relationship with the Lord will radically change your perspective as you face whatever obstacles come at you, whatever they are. Even Jesus, we see in Scripture, had to endure trouble and persecution and pain and suffering. Last week, we talked briefly about the anguish he felt just before being arrested, how he sweat drops of blood even. And he, he prayed and he asked God to, to let this cup, let this bitter cup pass from me if it be your will. However, he was ultimately willing to endure the cross, as Hebrews says, for the joy set before him for the sake of you, the sake of me, experiencing new life, abundant life in him. And if we want our faith to be refined and perfected, then chances are we will have to go through fire. Look at Romans 8, verse 17. And if children, also heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we what? Suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. <laughs> this this just sounds crazy to even think it or say it, but there's something beautiful about seasons of suffering in our lives. When we feel like the, the, we are the most difficult points ever in our lives, Lord, this is the hardest it's ever been. Oh, that's when God is able to shine his light the brightest. Oh, uh, maybe God has you in the current season you're in right now so that he can shape you, mold you, equip you to be, uh, again, like I said, who he wants you to be. Is that comfortable? No. This may not be comfortable, but the Bible promises that we can still have joy in the midst of suffering. That just doesn't sound right, Lord. Are you sure? Yes. Joy in the midst of suffering. The decision that Jesus made to, to endure the cross, man, that is just, in the eyes of the world, that is just so foolish. Why? Culturally, I mean, this was a death tool that illustrated shame. It was, it was for criminals to be punished. And yet, Jesus was willing to die that way. Why? For the joy set before him. For the joy set before him. Wait, wait, wait. So that means that Jesus was joyful and reconciling sinners like us to God. Yes. Yes, that's what I'm saying. And I wonder, uh-oh, here we go, though. I wonder if maybe... We're called to take a similar posture in our endurance. Think of it this way. Does it bring you joy to think about those in your life that don't yet know Jesus coming to Jesus? Think of that. Oh, emphatic yeses right over here. Yes. That person that you only see on Thanksgiving or Christmas, and they're like, don't talk about Jesus and politics. And oh, I don't want to get into all that. I just want to eat and leave and watch some football and whatever else it may be, or maybe an occasional birthday, whatever it is, and you just mm, don't come here with that Jesus stuff. I encourage you to go in there with that Jesus stuff. I don't care what they have to say in that moment. I love them, but I represent the Lord first. And I'm going to tell you about Jesus. Oh, just, oh just, just open that pathway for me, Lord. That gives me great joy to think about. I think about my kids my oldest, Lila, is seven. She's asking great questions right now, but they're not believers in Jesus at this moment. They're believers in following mommy and daddy. And we're here. And, and, we, and we encourage them at home, and we need to do those things. We encourage them at the church, and you do a fine job of that as well. Thank you for your leadership with my children. But oh my goodness, yes, I want, I want them to come to Christ. I'd love to cry my, my, my eyes out, ball my eyes out while I'm baptizing one of my kids or all of my kids. Be an amazing thing. Mm. What if God is trying to use you to plant the gospel seeds in their lives? Even through sharing Christ, he will perfect your faith. It's hard, but you should do it. Keep your eyes fixed on the cross. Endure whatever the race brings. And check this out. Remember, you are not alone in the race. You're not alone. 
All throughout the ministry of Jesus on earth, he was reminding people that he wasn't alone. God the Father was directing his steps. And Jesus, we see, was finding moments. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was spending one-on-one time with the Father. He models for us what it means to be fully reliant on God's strength, God's plans. And this is where the Holy Spirit comes in. When we realize what it means that we're never alone, then we are, are willing to allow God to lead us through difficult things. Difficult things. Seven, seven and a half years ago, I would have never imagined being your pastor. December of 2016 was the roughest point in my ministerial life. I would say probably my life period. I had a student that I had led to the Lord. He came on Wednesdays only. Uh, I got to lead him to the Lord. I got to baptize him in our church. That was the one Sunday he did come uh, to my church as we, we baptized him. It was a really neat thing. Well, then December 3rd, 2016... Uh, Late that Saturday evening, he went to a party and the parents, for the the mom, for whatever reason, provided the kids alcohol and she left them to go to the store or something. Well, they get into the gun cabinet. His mom, the story goes, his mom, this is what I hear. I I wasn't there, don't know exactly what went down. The story goes, his mom found out he was drinking, getting drunk, threatened to come get him and He shot himself in the face while on the phone with his mom. Killed himself. Okay. Went to his funeral. Did a graveside service at the school. That was kind of a neat thing they allowed me to do. I say neat. It's a wrong word for that scenario. Something I hope never to duplicate again. Had kids doubting their faith because, uh uh-oh, this unforgivable sin. He killed himself. But he had professed to us in front of everybody that he was a believer in Jesus. I don't find anywhere in the Bible that he lost his salvation over one dumb thing he did. Now, thankfully, the mom went to jail, as she should have, for providing them that. Those are consequences for your actions. And I'm sure she has tons of regret with that. And, of course, I felt bad for the student's parents. The very next week, my sister, Cherie, flipped her truck almost died. I have no idea to this day why she wasn't wearing a seatbelt, but she flipped her truck about five times, almost died. I guess there's some kind of little wings on your spine. I don't know what they're called. She doesn't have them anymore. They're not there. Um, Yet she's doing fine to this day. Week after that, my dad was diagnosed with a pancreatic cancer that killed him in my home six months later. And uh, all the while, I'm a youth pastor Uh, Our worship pastor had left to go be a senior pastor elsewhere, so I was leading worship. We had a brand new daughter, first time, Lila. Uh, Was born in July of 2016, so she's five months old, right at it. There's just so much, so much going on, Lord. Why? Why is this happening? You know, and I, I felt sorry for myself, even though all these things had happened to other people. But man, I felt like I failed that student because I told you he only came on Wednesdays. So I called his pastor of the church I was told he went to on Sundays, called his pastor. The pastor had no idea who he was. And I said, well, his parents are so-and-so. And And he goes, hmm, what does that mean? Okay, hmm. Either they do or they don't go to your church. I'm not certain. And to this day, you know, I have some regret feeling that I passed the buck to that church to disciple him. He only came to my church on Wednesdays, right? Not even every Wednesday. So I kind of passed the buck on to them. They can do discipleship. They'll be fine. He'll be fine. But he wasn't fine. And so that's why that, and it's in the Bible, but that's why discipleship is such an important thing to me. I want us to do that. Yeah, we baptized Tanner. We baptized Caleb. Uh, We baptized Miss Helen. Uh, Yeah, I think that's the three I've done since I've been here. But how do we disciple them? How do you help us disciple them? It's a big deal to me, but I felt I failed that student. But the church, the church we went to, First Baptist Maybank, where I was a youth pastor, we had people just step up in amazing ways to us. We had adults show up that had never shown up before to help us out. We had students, parents were coming, and we just grew in our hurt together. I found it out, by the way, 
about him killing himself five minutes before Sunday school. And so now that changes everything we're going to do for the month of December. Everything. We were going to do some really cool things and go sing Christmas carols at the nursing home. And, and I had a really cool lesson planned. We're going to do a fun Jesus series. And we were going to have a fun little Christmas party. It all changed every bit of it because we needed to. It was completely different. They all knew him and loved him dearly. So leading worship, leading youth, and just broken. But God used amazing people in our lives. They were, they were always there. Now, I know the Lord is always there. Oh, but man, sometimes I take him for granted. Anybody else? I can't physically see him. Oh, so I take him for granted those people I know he sent them our way what I'm saying is through experiences like this I have personally witnessed how Jesus was perfecting and refining my faith now that doesn't mean I'm perfect not at all on this side of heaven that's not going to happen but he's perfecting and refining my faith and it happens when we're solely reliant on God's ability. Lord, I cannot do this. I don't even know that I'm willing to do this. I've never experienced burnout, and I pray that I never do. To this day, I've never experienced burnout that I hear about ministers talking about. Oh, but I experienced a season of wanting to quit. I just, I just want to stop, Lord. And he says, no, no, you're not doing that. But God, I love that he is willing to lead me through life. It's such an amazing thing. And if you'll let him, he'll do that for you. But we must learn to trust him. We must learn to have faith. We must learn to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit in us. Look at John 14, verse 16. Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. Forever. The Holy Spirit. Jesus himself says the Holy Spirit will never leave us. Whether you are enduring a tough season right now, or maybe you're going through a season where it's producing much fruit, and I pray that that continues. But whatever the case, you give glory to God for his faithfulness and never leaving, never forsaking us. And God, thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit so we are never truly alone in this journey. Please never feel that you're alone in the journey. The perfect love of Christ for his church is such an amazing gift, such a great encouragement, and it's worth remembering also that Christ received perfect love directly from the Father, his heavenly Father. I brought this up last week, but I really think it's worth remembering here, John 15, verse 9. As the Father has loved me, he says, I have also loved you. So then he commands us, remain in my love. Jesus The Savior of mankind is asking you to remain in his perfect love. So, in other words, don't go looking for it anywhere else. You're not going to find his love anywhere else. You're not. Stay. Oh, please stay. Remain and learn to abide in the love of Christ. As many of us can attest to, we know it all too well. You're not going to find the unconditional, the all-powerful love of Christ from some counterfeit God. You're not going to find it from that dream job, that vocation that you have. You're not going to find it there. You're not going to find it from your fun hab- hobbies of, of playing golf or whatever it is you do that you enjoy, your fishing, whatever it is. You're not going to find it there. You're not going to find it in that worldly relationship. You're just not. But I tell you, if that's you and you're seeking for those things in the wrong places, you've been looking for perfect love everywhere else but Christ. Oh, today, please, let me, let me invite you back. Let me invite you back to him today. Or maybe you would boldly say, I've, I've never given my life wholly in those ever-capable hands of Christ. I'd say again, let me invite you there today. Receive the perfect love of Jesus because he's not leaving. Isn't that great? He's not going anywhere. He doesn't forsake you. He's going to remain faithful to you until the very end of time. Oh, great is thy faithfulness. Love that song. The last verse of the day, check this out with me. Matthew 28, verse 20. Teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And then here's here's my favorite part here for this sermon. Remember, I am with you always. 
always, to the end of the age. What a blessing that is. God, help us to not take that for granted. You're with us. You're with us. If you've never entrusted Jesus with your everything, talk to him. Talk to him today. Just admit, Lord, I've, for too long, I've, I've kept you out of my life. I realize I'm a sinner. I, I can't save myself. I really hope you know that. When you come knocking at my door, no longer, God, will I shut it in your face and say, no, thanks. No soliciting. He's offering you a free gift. He's not selling you anything. By faith, I, I urge you to, to gratefully received, receive this gift of salvation that only Jesus can offer. Be ready to trust in him as Lord, Savior, as your everything. He is the Son of God. He did die on the cross for your sins, and he did rise on the third day. I urge you, if you don't know him, ask him right now. Jesus, please come into my life today. I'm not okay. I'm struggling. I very much need you. I cannot do it myself. I pray that over you as well. I'd love to pray with you. There's nothing super special, really, about praying with me. But I do want you to, to pray. Pray constantly. We just talked about it. I'd love to pray with you. I just pray that if the Lord is calling you to that, that you'll be obedient. I don't care if you're sitting in the middle of, an, of a pew somewhere. Move, just get out. Move out. Those people will move. Don't let that stuff hold you back. Don't let awkwardness hold you back. You don't have to pray with me. You can come pray right here. You can come pray. You can pray in your seat. You can raise your hand and I'll come to you. I'll know exactly what that means. If you raise your hand when I'm done, I'll turn this off so nobody hears you on our live feed. I don't want you to feel any of that weird stuff, right, that we do because we're people. I don't care if you're an introvert, an extrovert, whatever you are. You need Jesus. So come to him today in this very moment. Those of you that have already been followers of Christ, that still applies to us. Come to Jesus every day. God, fill me with that Holy Spirit daily. Oh, God, I need you. I made some dumb decisions this week. I made some really bad ones in my life. God, help me to be better to my spouse, better to my kids, better in my home, better in my church. Better for you, Jesus. Whatever the Lord has called you to, honor it. Obey him. I guarantee you, though, he's not calling any of us to sit around and do nothing. If you want to be a part of our church, if you're not a member, I love you. We want you to be a part of our church too. We don't need pew sitters. We don't need pew sitters. We want to be different. To be different, we're going to do the service of our King, Jesus, together. I'd love to find what makes you tick. What's your niche? We'll figure those things out together. But in the meantime, all that serve him like never before. Because there's a world out here that is desperate for Jesus. Why aren't we telling them? Shame on us. Shame on me. Lord, I need to do more. I need to be better for you. God, help us to that. You can't do it by yourself. Come alongside us, but first seek his face in every way. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for the triumphant entry that you displayed in my life in December of 1995 when I accepted you, Lord. When I surrendered, surrendered to you. But yet in times in my life, God, I've not surrendered everything to you. So Lord, I pray that whatever I need to surrender, humble me. Make me do so, God. I, I, I always want to grab a hold of your perfect love. Please continue to perfect me, to mold me into who you'd have me to be. Help me to leave this church. Help me to leave my home and my wife better. 
God, I pray that over every believer in this room. And God, I pray for that non-believer here in person or watching online. God, that today would be the day of salvation. That they would come, grab a hold of your perfect love, that saving grace, Lord, that only you can give. Be with us right here, right now in this moment. Help us to be bold for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand with us and respond as God has called you.